question that's coming to us from Ireland. Oh, great. So, uh, hi, just wanted to ask Dr. Doreen about toilet training. I've been trying to toilet train my son for the last year using ABA. He can stra stay dry for the whole day and night, but will not pee or poo on the toilet unless I put his nappy on. He will pee in his pants in certain parts of the house when no one is looking. I have tried leaving the bathroom and closing the door in case it's a privacy issue that he just needs, but will still not. he still will not go. He is 11, nonverbal, and has severe autism. He was in a non-anti-ABA institution type school until two years ago and only had access to a quality fuller ABA program in the last six months, though always had at least 10 hours of ABA at home. So his understanding and skills are limited. Any advice would be great and thanks. And again, she says uh, from Ireland, we, we love that you guys, uh, we have a huge contingent of people watching in Ireland and we love oh, when you guys wonderful. give us input. I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. I don't know that I can, that I understand the problem though, because uh, I think the, what was written was that he doesn't uh, go on the potty unless we put his nappy on, which means his diaper. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, so how does that work? You put his diaper on and then he voids in the toilet. I'm not sure I really understand exactly what is going on. So and that would be important because yeah. I, I, it's, a, it's sort of a procedure where you have to shape the behavior and I'm not sure where, what the behavior is right now. Did you understand it, Chad? Well, it's sounding like to me that there is a flexibility issue here and that the only way that they can get success going onto the potty is that the nappy has to go on first. It's like the signal that now you can do it so they got to put the, the diaper on and then he can go to the bathroom. So you put it on, take it off, and then he can go to the bathroom. Otherwise, if they just remove the diaper, it's going to happen in his pants and, he, and, if, and they put him on the toilet he won't do it that's what it sounds like to me and if i have that wrong write us back in um but that's yeah. what it's sounding like to I me i mean if that's the case uh, which i don't know how if that's the case mm -hmm. then i would start to just reduce the size of the nappy it's a very basic thing so you just and then again it depends on what type of i, it's, I assume since he's older it's a pull-up mm -hmm. type thing so you literally just, what you could do is you could start cutting holes inside the, uh, the crotch area essentially mm -hmm. so that it ends up just being uh, like a belt mm -hmm. so that he feels that there's something there but he could actually with it on even sit down and void. So Does that make sense to you? So yeah. you start to grab very slow pieces cut out the bottom portion of it. So it's almost like systematic desensitization for not having the nappy on. Yeah, it's some, it's a shaping. It's like uh, you know, an example would be kids who always want to carry a blanket around with them. Mm -hmm. It's a safety blanket or mm -hmm. something. You know, that gives them some sense of security. Um, I will, over the course of a month, uh, chop off very small parts of it so <laughs> that it ends up being a very small piece that they can put in their pocket. Very cool. So it's stuff like that. So essentially, what you're doing is, for some, if that, if our understanding of the situation which is we're not correct, sure. which yeah. we don't really know. Uh, then what you do is just start to gradually reduce the size of the nappy and get rid of it. And he won't, after, uh, if you do it slowly, it won't affect his behavior at all. Okay. And please let us know if we understand what's going on correctly. Yeah. I'm not sure what it, how what's happening okay. right now. And I'm not sure either. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. We talked a lot, and we're going to continue talking a lot this week about safety issues. We had um, someone on uh, the show yesterday from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Oh, good. Talked about some forms that we can fill out as parents in the worst case scenario that if our children go missing. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about types of things to be aware of for first responders if your child does go missing. And and one of the pieces of advice they gave was that if they go missing to start looking in and around water, that that tends to be where our kids are drawn to. So the question that came in yesterday was why? Why are they right. drawn to water? And, and you know, it's not every child. Some children will be drawn to water and that's simply because they like to self-stimulate with water. Some children. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, so some of the children will like the 
you know, a, a lot of our kids will like to get to a source of water and then flap it like this, and en they enjoy the sound, but the visual, they definitely enjoy the visual uh, sort of aspect of how the water looks when they do this. Um, some of our children just like to swim in water, uh, even if they don't know how to, they enjoy the, the feeling of water around them. Um, and so, you know, there's a certain percentage of kids that are definitely drawn to water. Yeah. Uh, but other children could be drawn to other things. I mean, uh, children could be drawn to a place that echoes. Mm -hmm. They could be drawn to uh, particular types of light reflections. They could be, you know, the, it's such a huge variety of things that, that draw our kids. And, and it's usually self-stimulatory in nature, so a, a place that will allow you to self-stimulate. Okay. Uh, and I Which think is why it's so important, I mean, for you know, if you don't know if your child is drawn to water, you would know. It, it would be a primary yeah. self stimulatory thing. But that's why yesterday on the on the news segment we did, I was suggesting that you, really we should teach our kids how to swim. It's very important. Yeah, really important. Well, on the list of many different things to do. That's right. And uh, we we actually had um, because it was a case here. If you weren't watching yesterday here in Los Angeles, of uh, Romario Snow, who an 18-year-old who went missing for 20 days, and we had the opportunity to have um, both Romario and his mom, who ultimately was the person who found him. What an amazing woman she is! Searched the streets of Los Angeles for 20 days until she found him, and so that has spurred this whole conversation about, you know, the fact that a lot of our kids, uh, they they say that over 50 percent of our kids will elope for whatever reason. And and so I wondered if you could talk just a minute about, mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of people out there who are in denial and think that their kids are going to stop eloping, mm -hmm. um, that it's just a phase, like they're two, they're three, and that it's going to stop. And then sometimes, sometimes it doesn't stop without treatment for our kids mm -hmm. with autism. Mm -hmm. And then I also wondered if you could talk a little bit about the people who now have accepted, oh, my child is an eloper and feel that it's never going to stop. They're going to spend the rest of their lives doing that and feel that there's no hope okay so you know the whole concept of eloping like why do our children even run away um, and or adults um, and you would you know it's there is a sense of curiosity about various things that are in the environment they're just as I said certain stimuli like oh um, I think I hear water and you know keep in mind a lot of our kids have very different sensory abilities than we do and much stronger in certain areas and much weaker in other areas mm -hmm. so so I, I think I want to go see if that's water you know and, and they just start walking um, or um, they'll start looking up at the sun and they'll see a reflection of something and they'll think they can walk towards it mm -hmm. and they'll start walking and um, or they'll hear a sound that they're curious about and then they'll start pursuing it and the problem is that just like typically developing young children same thing with our kids and, and it, it just goes a, a, a longer age or a later age um, our, our kids are not aware of safety and danger and the fact that they will get lost and the fact that they could be abducted and the fact that they, um, you know, they could be just taken advantage of somehow or hurt somehow accidentally or they're not aware of any of those things. Or that they don't know how to swim. Like they, they don't, don't know how yeah. to swim, no, no concepts at all. Like I said, it's the same sort of functioning level of a younger child, you yeah. know? So like a three, four-year-old would also have the same types of safety yeah. issues, typical three or four-year-old. Um, oh, a car can hit me or, you know, any of those things. So um, they, it doesn't even occur to them that they're stepping into a dangerous zone. And so they just pursue that one element that's drawing them. So that's kind of, you know, it, and it is very, very typical of many, many children. I was trying to stress the importance of this yesterday on the segment because uh, at, at a certain age, every child will elope just simply because um, a from the antecedent perspective, they don't really know that they're putting them, placing themselves in, a, in an environment that's dangerous. 
from consequence perspective, in most cases, it's actually kind of like a game for our for our children, thinking that their parents will find them. Mm. So a lot of typically developing children either even will like run away and hide because it is uh, attention seeking and it's kind of fun to see the parents freaked out looking for mm. me. And they don't understand that it is not fun for the parents because they don't have that that theory of mind to understand right. what they're putting a parent through. But in my, so in other words, not that it's intentional, but they're not really aware of any of the consequences. And even if they are aware of the fact that a parent will come looking and screaming my name, they misinterpret that as oh, the parent is giving me attention. This is a game. So for many reasons, it's very attractive for our children to elope. Now, is it? can we stop it? Absolutely. It's, it's just the behavior, and you can change the behavior. And, you know, the reason typically developing kids get to a point where they don't do these things is fear, yeah. right? I mean, we talk about this in regards to anything else that's dangerous. And I've referred to uh, very... Uh, interesting psychologists in our field, old, you know, this is um, in the early 1900s, Watson, mm -hmm. you know, he came and said, I can do, I can change the behavior, I can turn any child into, you know, a uh, really angel-like child or into a psychopathic type child. And the reason that I can do that is because I can modify their behavior. And that's the whole sort of beginning of the understanding that changing behavior or ABA, which used to be called behavior modification, is a really powerful, powerful tool. Yeah. Um, and, you know, can, can do a lot of good and a lot of harm. So the example was that he had a baby and, you know, infants obviously are not really afraid of anything. Uh, because they haven't experienced anything yet. Yeah. And just like ABA, uh, how we when we say in ABA that you have a behavior and a consequence occurs to that behavior, and that uh, modifies the likelihood of recurrence of that behavior. So, let's say um, you know I will say hello to you, and you're very you smile when I say hello. So your smiling is a consequence to my saying hello, and therefore I start to learn that my behavior increases. I will tend to say hello to people more often now because I like to, I'm rewarded by their smiles. Right. So the same thing here, what he did was he had a child and the child was not afraid of, let's say, a snake or anything, any stimulus. And I think he used a, a rat or something, a white rat, but in, in the original studies. And so all he did was, so the child, the baby, the, you know, uh, I think, less than one year old, nine months or 12 months old, is sitting and playing with this uh, rodent. Mm. And um, <clears throat> then he would just pair the rat with a very loud sound behind the infant. So a very loud clapping sound or banging sound when the, infant, when the rodent came out. And of course, within a few pairings, the child was now terrified of the rodent. And so it's a, that's classical conditioning, and it is extremely powerful. That's like operant conditioning. It's a conditioning process. Mm -hmm. So whether, so in other words, the stimulus that was a neutral stimulus is now paired with, with a fear evoking, with a startling mm -hmm. stimulus, and therefore now the neutral stimulus takes on those properties, and in, in, in and of itself it becomes fear evoking. So that's what happens to normal children they learn and these are the fear elements yeah i'll touch fire and ouch my finger just burned that's operant conditioning mm -hmm. so okay now i know i'm not going to touch fire anymore right um why do we not go towards spiders or rodents or whatever simply because we are so aware of our parents reactions right that we realize oh they're showing me fear that means this is something i should stay away from so if you are a parent and you love all kinds of insects, your kids are most likely not going to be afraid of them. Right. Unless they see something scary on TV or something. Right. So it's always a learning experience. So what I'm saying is with our kids who wander, they never are aware of the stimuli in the environment that should cue them into this is dangerous. Like what happens if you're a typical child and you run away? Mom and dad will be like, 
where are you going? Come back here. It's not safe. Don't ever do that. I remember Charlie once hid behind the car in a parking lot, and I was terrified, and I must have really yelled at her, you know, and yeah. she never did that again. Right. But our kids don't get those messages. So they, it is dangerous, but it is teachable. Okay. So it's a matter of teaching them. Now, in the meantime, there are many things that parents can do, and I think these are worth mentioning here. So first thing is, please make sure you have locks on the doors that are um, that have an alarm. Those are very cheap, very easy to order. Amazon, you can order them. They're little boxes like this, and it just goes on the door, and if the door opens, the alarm goes off. These are very important to have because you will know and be aware that someone's coming in or out. Yeah. Also, a lot of people ha do have um, bracelets, just ha identification bracelets. A lot of people have now started using the GPS tracking devices yeah. um, that you can actually put on the child's wrist or uh, ankle. And then, of course, it would be important if you do have a child who's a wanderer or who's a child who isn't aware of safety issues, Take your child to the neighbors and introduce to the neighbors. Tell the neighbors that your child might wander off and what's going on. Actually go visit the local fire station and the local police station. Introduce your child to those individuals and say, I'm just letting you know in case, it's just so they become familiar with autism as well. Yeah. Um, and and you know the the special things about your child. I mean, a lot and of and your kids, kid will love it too. By yeah, the that's way. true. They love the visit, and 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 then they will not fear those people. That's right. The police and the fire department. That's right. We we had a great time and meeting our important. local firemen and policemen. Yeah. Yeah, that's very important. And then you know, for those kids who are drawn to water, please uh, teach them how to swim. Yeah. Like that is kind of important as well. Don't forget, all our kids learn everything. They're capable of learning everything. They just learn it in a different way and it requires a little bit more of a structured instructional process which is ABA. But what could be more important than teaching them safety? Absolutely. So it's something that we need to focus on. Thank you so much for sure. telling us all those great tips. We're going to take a short break. We've got a lot of questions that have been coming in. We're going to start to get some of those questions after these messages. Stick with us. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grampuche is here with us and she's answering your questions live on the show. So you can be writing them into the live feature. Keep them coming. Okay. Hi, Dr. Doreen. How can I tell what kinds of learner my son is? I was convinced he was mostly visual because even when he uh, when he got to when he gets to read, he reads along. He does better with schedules rather than without. But yet the doc the developmental doctor's report said he is auditory more than visual. I seem to disagree, but want to know how to be sure to know him better as well as help him learn. I think people may assume a lot about him even professionals, uh, because he is very verbal. And we don't have an age on this child, so if... Um yeah, I, I mean, it's easy to test things out. And if, if testing is showing that he's auditory, he's an auditory learner, I, I assume that's what you mean, that his auditory input skills are stronger than his visual. And if you feel that he's a visual learner, well, then good for him. In other yeah. words, he's got strengths in both areas. Yeah. But it's easy to test because you can just give him new concepts, anything, and I don't know his skill level, but anything that is completely new in a visual format versus a spoken format and then see which one he responds better to. Okay. It's really that simple. I would, if he is... Um, I think the, the mom wrote he's beginning to read or he reads along. It, it sounds like uh, she says even when he gets to read, he reads along. Yeah. So I don't know if he is all that visual. I'm not sure. But keep in mind that... Uh, the visual stimulus is tends to be more beneficial to pretty much everyone because it's it's a stable remaining stimulus. So something that's visual. If I write something down and I put it in front of you, it's there. It remains. So you're, if your processing speed is low, mm -hmm. you can revert back to it. It's a present thing that you can always see. If it, if your processing speed is low and I say something, it's gone. And you won't catch it because your processing speed is low, so it needs to be repeated numerous times. So that's the difference between visual and auditory. So in general, 
visual. That's why we make notes for ourselves. Okay. okay? I'm, just, I'm thinking of myself. I'm, yeah. I have to take notes or right, that would, right. it would be gone because, for me. Exactly. Because it's not, you, you, the alternative to that is uh, to, you know, tape it and then it'll respond to, it'll, you mm -hmm. can have a recorder that tells you all the things, right? Mm -hmm. But we like to see things visually because you can put a list of items. Yeah. You can, there's a lot of things you can do visually that you can't do auditorily because it's a moment in time versus a st solid item. Yeah. So uh, in general, people tend to do better with visual simulation anyway. So that's what, what you might be seeing. And the fact that he likes, I think you said he likes, um, schedules. Yeah. Every one of our kids likes schedules, and the reason they like schedules is because it gives them a sense of what's coming next, yeah. so that they're not just being maneuvered around. You know, one of the things that I always teach teachers when I'm working with teachers is, I like, please give him a schedule and please stick with the schedule, even if you're going to change it every day. It doesn't matter. Just put it up on the wall, go through it with him, because it is unbelievably frightening for an individual who doesn't know what's happening in the next five minutes. If you know I have, not only do I put schedules on the wall, I use timers often. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're going to do, these five activities, and each one I'm setting the timer so you know when this one's over and then we go to the next one. So it's kind of like becomes, you know, this is what your day looks like type yeah. thing. So that's uh, a given as well. Most of our children, I would say, all of our children really love knowing what's coming next and so that's not necessarily the fact that he likes that doesn't necessarily indicate that he's a visual learner okay um you know having said that a lot of times uh, the best way to find out is not really depending on testing. It's more about just how does he learn? You you know him. Yeah. See how yeah. he learns. Yeah, I, I tend to think that mom's gut here uh, is pretty accurate. Right. She knows exactly right. what right. kind of learner. But how great that it shows that he can learn in both ways. Yeah, because absolutely. that's the ideal thing anyway. Absolutely. Okay, remarkable. Okay, uh, somebody wants to know, Dearest Dr. Doreen, the topic that I've been wanting to know about is comorbidities among children and adults on the spectrum. In particular, when it comes to psychiatric comorbidities, do you know why there aren't any more resources uh, for these cases, and why are those with autism who have psychiatric comorbidities forced to choose between mental health and developmental departments? There isn't a consultation between the two. We are here in New York and come across this issue all the time. Is there anything we can do as a community with different abilities to change this? And she says many thanks. What a, an amazing question yeah. and so eloquently worded. So autism is a very strange thing. It has it kind of crept up on everyone and nobody really knew what to do with it. You know, even right now autism is classified under the mental disorders obviously, but then it is referred to as a developmental disorder and then also a lot of people most of us think that of course it should be more of a neurological disorder. So you know, we're very confused about what autism is still to this day. I mean, we've gotten a little bit better, I think, with the DSM-5 in terms of the diagnostic criteria uh, being a little bit broader, mentioning sensory, mentioning medical, never has before. But having said that, we don't know enough about autism. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, confusion. And at the same time, of course, when you talk about state agencies, nobody really wants to own it because they don't want to fund it. It's really that simple. So here I have the same exact issue all over the country. In California, for instance, we have the regional center system, which is the Department of Developmental Disabilities. And they are responsible for a certain aspect of funding for the ABA that we do with the children. Um, then there's, of course, the schools and special education uh, plans and the Department of Education, and they're, of course, responsible for enacting FAPE, you know, and giving you everything that you need in order for, you, for your child to get a free and appropriate education. And then, of course, there's the insurance companies who are supposed to be providing funding for anything that's medically necessary. Now, those three types of things, sort of, you know, last resort payment and what's uh, appropriate education and what's medical necessity are all really vague uh, uh, you know, words that, uh, so it enables the three agencies to kind of keep putting the ball in the other person's court yeah. and saying, this is not really my issue, it's yours. 
So, and, and let me tell you, had autism not been written as one of the four disorders that regional centers have to cover, they would not be interested in dealing with it. Obviously, it's a, the most costly disorder. So that's part of the problem, I think, is that people have that uh, sense of confusion about what it actually is, and then they also have this, you know, not really wanting to deal with it. Um, because it's just uh, costly to deal with. And by putting it in the other person's court and saying, oh, I, we, that doesn't sound like us, it sounds like them, it may just be postponing. Yeah, absolutely. But, it, but every time they postpone, it saves them money. It right. costs you, but it saves them, them money. money. And now I want to make sure I address the respon the actual thing, which is comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidities. And, you know, there are, I could probably think of a lot of different psychiatric disorders that could be comorbid with autism. Many, many. Okay. I mean, there are kids that pull out their hair, you know, that, that would be a comorbidity with trichotillomania. Yeah. I mean, I have the most common, obviously, would be anxiety. I have a ton of kids who have anxiety disorders going on. I have a ton of OCD, obsessive compulsive, used to be one of the anxiety disorders. This is not a change I like in the, mm -hmm. in the new DSM, but now it's a separate disorder. But regardless, OCD could be definitely um, a comorbidity with, with uh, autism. And so there are a lot of psychiatric comorbidities. I think of it this way, um, I guess, aside, I mean, you have a point in that you want the resources of both the Department of Health and the Department of Developmental Disabilities and probably the Department of Education as well. Um, but aside from that, it doesn't matter. Just move on. You know, in other words, get the treatment that you need. Right now, you're in New York. New York has is an insured state. Um, you know, get on, get the insurance coverage that you need. That is the primary source of uh, resource right now for our in, our ch kids and adults. Okay. Uh, really good advice. It's an area where we need more attention. Uh, somebody wrote in and said, Hi, Dr. Doreen, we are in Virginia Beach, and mm -hmm. I know that there is a CARD in Alexandria, but I'm not sure if I'd be able to get remote services from CARD since it's three hours away. We do have insurance that covers my son until he turns seven. We are skills users and have been for quite a while. What would you suggest I do if I want to get services from CARD? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I We have, a, we've on and off had a lot of kids in, in Virginia Beach. So uh, you can get remote services. It's not necessarily going to be from the Alexandria office. Okay. The Alexandria location is a little bit overwhelmed. They're, they have a huge waiting list and they're kind of packed solid and they have a school. So they're not just a, they're, they're an ABA center as well as a school. And actually they're splitting right now so that the school will be, be on different grounds so we can double the school because it's so uh, like, ridiculously growing um so and i just i was just out there last week and i don't know if any of the supervisors there have even a moment of time available actually no i take that back you oh you're it, did they say we have insurance funding they have insurance funding until he turns seven and why is that i don't think virginia i don't think any of the states have a have the ability to limit by age. If they do now, they won't. So. Well, I think uh, a lot of times it'll say that the state will cover to a certain, certain age. age. But uh, that's illegal to say that. So. But the, yeah, there's the Medical Parity Act, right. which means that far more likely you can get it a lot longer. Right. <laughs> and right. if you talk to somebody at CARD, they'll explain all that to you in great detail. Right. But it may say seven, but it's far more likely that you have it until 12 or 18. Right. So what I would suggest is that you just get in touch with um, the the workshop department, which is now called Remote Services. Remote Services. The Remote Services. Uh, you will end up probably talking to Dorothy, I think, and uh -huh. she will then refer you to. Uh, the director of that department is John Galley. I think I give out his name more than anyone else, <laughs> probably because I love him so much. He's such a great guy. He's such a good person in addition to being an amazing clinician and he's truly one of the most caring people we have and he will um, just take care of things he will make sure that you are assigned a supervisor who meets the qualifications of your insurance that's an important thing and that you will get services and he will try for to get you someone from the East Coast uh -huh. so that you don't have a lot of travel and so on to pay for uh, you know, my 
I shouldn't do this. I was about to say <laughs> oh. the person I recommend, and I, uh -oh. I wouldn't do that. Okay. But I mean, you are in Virginia Beach, and I think um, you will have you'll have some options from the East Coast. But regardless, we have about 200 BCBAs now, so um, you'll definitely be able to access. And by the way, since you are a skills user, you won't need as much from us. You know, you're very familiar with our program as a skills user, so you will need guidance on you know getting having a supervisor consult with you will move things faster a lot lot faster and then the supervisor can also really work on the the quality of your actual th therapists I hope you have therapists and you're not just doing this yourself but you know that will really speed things up so significantly should we say then that the best course of action at this moment in time is to Contact call the 800 number services, yeah and then they will put and and tell them that you want to talk to remote services uh, they'll they'll put you through um, and, and and get you all. So the best place to go to start is the 800 number. Yeah, I think that's how we do it now. Admissions and the 800 number people will give you all the information, or they'll have Dorothy contact you. And uh, yeah, please do it. We'd love to. We can work with you and get some model in place that works for you. And and feel free to say that you were watching Autism Live. You, uh, and you know, had a conversation. User. You're a skills user that you know Dr. Grampache encouraged you to call. And, and yeah, because to get this we number. do have about 200 kids on the wait list right now, but not remote services. So remote services okay. will end up. Good. They have a wait list too, but it's not as bad as the card wait list. Having said that, it really does make a difference that you say you're a skills user. Okay. All right. Very good. We're going to take a short break and come back with more of these questions. We're going to get in as many of them as we possibly can. Stick with us. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. I want to start with a question that somebody said, will the video for yesterday's show be available later today that you missed it? It will be. It has to be special processed uh, for reasons that we won't go into, but it will be available later on today and I mentioned that we filmed a segment yesterday with Romario Snow and with his mom and we're going to be showing that tomorrow so you'll want to stay tuned tomorrow for that and the the episode from yesterday will be available later on today okay so somebody wants to know are there adult services for speech in North County South Dakota area in general mm -hmm. adult services resources are hard to find in general everything is hard to find in South Dakota, North Dakota. The Dakotas have very little to offer right now for this field. I would have to, I'm not sure what there is, but here's what I suggest you do. Um, and I don't know if we have North and South Dakota on yet, but there is a software, there's a web URL for Love My Provider, LMP, Love My Provider. And what it does is it's, um, you put in your zip code and it provides you a list of all the providers in different areas, speech, ABA, you name it, you know, um, and in, in your area and the distance. And it's gradually filling up. It doesn't obviously have everyone yet, so it might not have hit the North and South Dakota, but I know that um, they are working on filling it. Um, you, what else can you do? I suppose you could get in touch with the association that uh, credentials speech pathologists which I think is called ASHA, A-S-H-A, and uh, online, and then they would have a list as well. And I always recommend reaching out. You, you, every parent should have a, a local and a global support, uh, parent support group um, that you can refer to for things like this, for the global ones that you can be asking questions about, you know, the bigger concepts. But sometimes you need to know which dentist right. is going to be amenable right. to what your child right. is going to need to do. And this is really what LMP does. Yeah. So, you know, once LMP hits the stage, it's got everything. It's yeah. got dentists, doctors, hairdressers, you name it. And if, if it is isn't as full where uh, oh and she they wrote back and I I said South Dakota mm -hmm. uh, because for SD but they meant San Diego oh, my San bad Diego. San Diego much different story okay San Diego very easy <laughs> I yeah. apologize but we gave information for South Dakota, South Dakota yeah. but San Diego definitely love my provider will have information on oh, San yeah, Diego love my provider will have a lot of information <laughs> and. Um, they're asking for a speech pathologist. I know some. there are some good speech pathologists in San Diego. What you should do is actually probably give a call to our San Diego office. Uh, we have one in San Marcos and one in San Diego. I would call the San Diego office and just ask to speak with... Um, 
Well, you can ask to speak to any of the supervisors or you can ask to speak with one of the senior staff. And there's a few people who've lived there forever. And so one person who could definitely help you is Teresa Contreras. She's going to kill me for giving out her name, but please just call her. It'll take her two minutes. She knows all the providers in the area. Teresa Contreras, and the other one would be Jennifer Close, or Yakos, Jen Yakos. Mm -hmm. She'll be able to give you. Um, also, our, one of the older administrators there, Karen Wiley. All of these people are in our San Diego office, and they will be able to easily tell you names of speech therapists in the area who will be appropriate. But also, they're asking for adult services and resources, and San Diego we do, actually we do adult has services. Yes. Yeah, we ourselves at CARD do adult services of all types. Uh, so I'm not sure if you even need speech services, because if you get your uh, adult child into our program, then we will be doing uh, speech as well. So if you're interested in that, then have a conversation with our admissions department. And that would which be the 800, 800 number. number. Okay, thank you for writing back. Uh, so sorry, I saw SD and... Uh, I would have, SD would have never even occurred to me to be South Dakota. I don't know the well, Dakota. You know, my son was just in fifth grade where they had to do all the states and all the capitals. And so why. And all the abbreviations. So that's where my head went to. So what can I tell you? Uh, how do I get the school to take elopement seriously for my mm. child. Any Great suggestions? Question. Yes, get it written into the IEP. That's how you do it. You can call an emergency IEP anytime. Uh, well, right now, if you called an emergency IEP, you'd have to wait until the fall because school's out, basically August. They won't have any services. So you will, however, you will get it into the IEP and then it's a legal document and then they will take it seriously. And you just have to be, like everything else, you have to be the persistent parent who, you know, I would, what I would do if my child had elopement issues and was in a school environment, a few things. I would definitely put a GPS on him or her. Um, secondly, I would uh, get in touch with the, like I would literally go and introduce my child to all the security people at the, the school, like the guards, there's usually a security guard there. Um, I would definitely make sure you have a conversation with the principal separately and if your child has AIDS or anything, get it into the IEP so that they hold responsible a whole bunch of school staff. Um, in the IEP, it generally will say who's responsible for, for what and so you want to make sure of that. Uh, the fact that he, your child elopes is reason enough to request a one to one aid. I mean, it's a danger matter, and, and you just need to be very persistent with it. Yeah, I, and I, I, I want to say this in the nicest possible way that we've, we've had this tragedy in our community, Avante Aquendo, and nothing can bring him back to us. But he left a legacy for us that, as parents, we need to stand on. And just last week in New York City, they passed the law called Avante's Law requiring that they look at schools and prioritize where they have to have safety doors. And, and that may sound like it's just for New York City, but the truth of the matter is that gives every single parent mm -hmm. who knows about that power at that IEP table to talk about safety issues. I remember when my son was starting at a new school for kindergarten and I toured the school with a camera mm -hmm. and took pictures of every single gate that was unlocked. And then we had a meeting <laughs> and they brought me back and they said, we fixed it. And I said, okay, great. And we toured and I had the camera again and took pictures of two gates that were unlocked. Good for you. That's amazing. And, and then they put self-closing um, things and they put padlocks on certain um, gates and they changed things as a result. But you kind of have to be a pain in the you know what. Yeah. And... And be that pain in the you know what, and don't be embarrassed about it. This is your child's life, yeah. you know, go after it. But also, you know, and in some ways, perhaps, I mean, if you can afford it, just order those alarms that I was saying for the doors. Yeah. The school is supposed to pay for that, obviously, to keep a safe environment for your child. But I mean, you know, these types of things tend to take a long time. Yeah. And, and just so you know, we're trying to do an initiative in partnership with an organization that actually provides the GPS watches. And if we can't, that's ACT Today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, stay on top of ACT Today's website as well if we do manage a partnership with them. Either way, whether ACT will do it or CARD will do it, we'll do it because 
they have these cool GPS devices. But the one I saw yesterday is just very big. It's large, so it won't work for small children. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I'm just saying that you know there are a lot of agencies that are now actually providing these at no cost to the parents. So please do follow up on that. Yeah, there's even uh, Senator Schumer from New York State has uh, got a law that I believe has passed where your insurance should cover it, no matter great, you know. Great. So and you know that we are. Uh, of course, working on a bill in California for the to the join silver law. the silver alert. Yeah, so we're trying to join the developmental disabilities uh, population under this uh, this silver alert, which is generally for elderly with Alzheimer's, where you know they will wander off. Yeah, and so if we can add our kids to that, at least there will be an alert system in the country, which is yeah. very good. For the first time, it will make it possible because you know we have the Amber Alert system, and it works really well to right. notify people on all the highways when somebody is missing. And we have not been able to access that when a child has eloped because right. until now you've had to be able to prove that the child was abducted. But this law would change that, and we would have access to that. It would be groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. It would be really incredible. Okay. I'm to power on here. Uh, is the ADOS scored with a point system or is it subjective? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the question? Yes. And then yeah, there's it, a follow up to it. Yeah, but that's it, is, the first it one. is scored with a point system, but it is also subjective. Okay. So, in other words, it's, um, it requires the child to do certain things. And if you, the, how you score what he did is subjective. So, you know, did he do it? It's not just did he do it or didn't he do it? It's kind of like, did he do it and pay attention to me or these other things? How many times did you have to respond? Did, did I have to help him? All that sort of stuff. So it is pretty subjective and it is scored on a point system and it is the gold standard in this field. Although personally, I hate it. I don't think it's a good test, but. Just okay. that's my personal feeling. Okay. Um, then the follow-up for it is: uh, Can ASD be diagnosed without the ADOS, Absolutely. or is it considered best practice to use that tool? No, you don't need the ADOS at all to diagnose. I never use the ADOS. I only use the ADOS if I'm doing a grant. Very honestly, so for research purposes. And by the way, when you the ADOS, when you class, when you uh, train to become an ADOS administrator, you you can become reliable to a clinical level, which means you will, with a group of other people, you will have a certain reliability of how you score a child. But I think that's only eighty percent reliability. But if you want to go to a research level, you have to get I think ninety or ninety-five percent reliability with other people. And let me tell you, when we trained, we were a group of like. I don't know, maybe 10 people who have known each other and worked in the industry for 20 years, all of us, people like Vince, mm -hmm. right? All of us together. And we took, we had to spend two days getting reliability. Okay. That's how subjective it is. Okay. So do you need it? Absolutely not. Most of the time, if an insurance agency or something is asking for it, it's just because they're trying to make life difficult. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next question. Are there any inpatient programs in California that deal with aggression and violent behavior? We have already tried ABA in the home and it wasn't successful. Um, so they're looking for being able to... I don't know. Um, I don't know about that. I, I don't know what inpatient programs there are here. I don't think that we have any good ones for violent behavior. UCLA has a partial hospitalization program. That's not what you're looking for. The only one that I really know of that is for real violent behavior is the program at Kennedy Krieger. Um, and I, that's in Baltimore. So if you have the possibility to look into that, that's the one that we refer to when there's real violent behavior going on. Okay. Having said that, you know, depending on the age and size of the individual we're talking about, uh, we do have a lot of violence when we start out and it, we are able to handle it in most of the time in, in homes. I mean, there's only been like maybe over the course of my career, one or maybe two cases that I've referred to Kennedy. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know, can somebody help me in Spanish to make my question? I have one, di one son diagnosed with autism and he is eight years old. And we have been getting ready to announce here on the show that we're going to have a new segment that's going to air every Tuesday uh, with um, and I, uh, Juan, Juan, but Juan I can't Ronderos remember. Juan Torres. Okay, that's, I couldn't come up with the last name. And Juan, we had Juan on the show a couple of weeks ago, uh, 
a, a really dynamic young man who is going to be, he's going to start out doing a regular segment on Tuesdays. And then in the fall, he's going to have a, a segment that we'll have on our YouTube channel all in Spanish. But in the mm, meantime, it's very exciting. It's, uh, so I hope that that will be quick enough for you. But if in the meantime, if you need him to help ask a question uh, between now and then, um, just contact him. Okay. And so uh, I don't know what his email is. Well, but his you know, email is j.ronderos, I think, at okay. uh, centerforautism.com. Okay. Uh, so that's a great way that you can be asking your yeah, questions and, in Spanish. I mean, don't we have, I think we also have information about our Spanish speaking program on our website. I'm not sure, but please do there, contact him. He's in charge of our, he's working on the Spanish speaking program with Maria together, I believe. It's called Card Espanol mm -hmm. and it's- and In fact, they have their own website. Yeah. So, um, which I believe, if I knew what the title of that was, this but I think you can program. just look up uh, Card Espanol. I, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, I hope that you will take the opportunity to do that because um, he can I, be I very can helpful. You are beyond helpful. <laughs> Look at you multitasking. Uh, and I'm just going to rapid fire questions. Okay, this sure. is a really important question. My question is, do you know an awesome psychologist in Fox Valley in Wisconsin who does FBA? It's for myself. I tried to do an FBA on my last challenging behavior by myself, but I don't uh, know why... Why do I always act out when my father, um, and I'm not sure uh, syntax here, there's something that his father says and that he acts out because of it. He says, I have some ideas. It might be because I lost my best friend on Valentine's Day. And he said, please help. Um, so, you know, some feelings uh, yeah. that are coming up for him. And he wants, he's been trying to do the FBA on himself. Yeah. Uh, so I, what advice? Um, I mean, I don't think it's a good idea to do an FBA on yourself. I might, I don't know that I would be able to just sit there and do an FBA on any of my behaviors. Um, use our, we have a fabulous system online, uh, which you can go to, uh, I'm not sure if it's part of, if it's, is it labeled CIFA or is it labeled, um, BIP Builder. I think it's called I, BIP Builder. And then you find the CIFA under the BIP Builder right. is so what I remember. Right. So you go to BIP Builder, uh, Google that, mm -hmm. BIP, Behavior Intervention Plan Builder, and BIP Builder. And uh, there you'll find the section that says CIFA, which is CARS Indirect Functional Assessment, and that is where you start. And you answer a bunch of questions about whatever individual behaviors you're talking about here. And then that will uh, not only give you the function, that's the functional assessment, but it'll also be able to take you to the VIP builder and give you uh, a behavior intervention plan. Okay. Now, you were looking for a psychologist, I believe. In Wisconsin. Right. So psychologists will not know anything about what a beha behavior intervention plan is or a functional assessment is. That's not lingo for psychologists. That is lingo for behavior analysis. And the program that's in um, Wisconsin is the WEEP, which is the Wisconsin Early Autism Project with Glenn Sallows. Um, running it, and I'm sure Glenn will ha be the best resource for you. He will be able to tell you other programs in the state and what else exists and where you should go and so on, but he won't be able to. He might, I don't know, but he's, you know, psychology is a very different discipline than behavior analysis. Behavior analysis is a type of psychology, mm -hmm. but, you know, psychodynamic Freudian analysis mm -hmm. is also a type of psychology. So really you have to kind of decide what it is you want help with. Mm -hmm. And if it is help with something like anxiety, then I would talk to a, a psychologist first. If it's help with behavior, then I would talk to a behavior analyst and Glenn will be able to help you with that. Okay. Great, great advice. And then uh, do me a favor and let me know how that works out for you so that uh, we can keep in touch. And I've got, yeah, I know who you are. You've sent that to me. So uh, keep in touch with me on that. And then uh, Emily, we're out of time or we have time for one quick question. 
I don't have her. Have time. Oh, she, yeah, okay, I don't have her. Okay, uh, and this is not a quick question, but I have a child who's 14 years old and he is suffering from autism, but he is suffering from ep epilepsy. Is there a way to get rid of it? And I, I'm not an, entirely sure whether we're talking about getting rid of the epilepsy or getting rid of the autism. Yeah, and if you have epilepsy, you're dealing with that first. You're not going to be dealing with anything else because that is the primary thing that's causing him to suffer and you to suffer, and that's very, very difficult. So yes, you definitely, I mean, it's not something you get rid of. It's something that you get under control with medication and diet. So I really do recommend that you connect with a good neurologist. This is a tough one. You might have to go through a few, but please do because a lot of individuals with epilepsy are able to maintain control over it with dietary change and medication change. So uh, please go ahead and do that. And that'll be very helpful in itself. It's important to get the medical stuff stabilized before you start dealing with changing behavior. Uh, I've found very often that, I mean, it's just the primary thing to do. If you start doing a lot of behavioral intervention that causes, you know, the epilepsy interferes a lot. Like when we have seizures, we tend to lose a lot of functioning. We tend to lose what we've learned. So it's kind of like going in a cycle. Fix the epilepsy first. Okay. Work on that first. And I can't bear to leave this question, so I'm going to squeeze sure. it in too. My daughter was just diagnosed with ASD. She starts kindergarten this year. How many children are in public school and thriving well? That's a tough question. Um, and, you know, first thing I want to say is I, you must be going through a tough time, and I hope that you're not experiencing too much fear. Uh, don't, uh, you know, try to trust in the fact that you've been given a task and that you are capable of, and it will be a very educational experience, and there's a big uh, com support community, um, such as Shannon, and many other moms who will be there for you. and. Uh, it's not so much your school that is the issue. It's a couple of different things you got to think about. One is, so I mean, yeah, I've had public schools that are better than private schools. Let's just put it that way. But that's not what you are depending on here. If your child has been diagnosed with ASD, you will need uh, behavioral intervention. You will need ABA. So what you, and, it, and you said your child's five and just got diagnosed. So that means it's a pretty high functioning child because otherwise the diagnosis would have come a little earlier. So my recommendation is you immediately get with a good behavioral program, um, behavior analysis, you know, an ABA program card. If you're around us, get with us. If you're not, there's plenty of other good ones. Uh, and please start that process first. Um, shoot for recovery, which means do uh, intensive work now. This is not necessarily lifelong. It's kind of like if I want to teach you how to play the piano, I could teach you, you know, one hour a week for the next 10 years and you'll get really good. Uh, or maybe you will, or maybe you'll give up, or maybe there will be other things that will become more important. Or I could do 40 hours a week, and it'll take me probably a year before you get really good. You know, so um, do hit it intensively now, especially if your child's five and going into kindergarten, you can possibly delay a year or just reduce. So in other words, you're already hitting the age where a lot of other stuff becomes important in school. So reduce the amount of time in school, just do half days or do every other day or don't do school at all yet. Intensify, do massive amounts of ABA. ABA is like one-to-one -one tutoring at this point and really, really accelerates. You might even just need a year and a half or two years and you're done and then your child can mainstream and move on. So don't think about the school, think about getting him the programs that he needs. And then school becomes just a, a setting for him to integrate and, and uh, interact with other kids. It doesn't become, it is not to be depended on in terms of this is my educational setting, this is where my child learns. No, your child's going to be learning from their ABA program. And I love that answer, um, but just to bring it full circle, when you get all those things that she's talking about, lots of kids excel in public schools yeah, yeah, and are fine. Yeah. But you've got to have that base. That's right. what's really um, key to it.